Okay, good afternoon. Um, I don't know if you want to wait for a couple of seconds for everybody to join. Um, so welcome to the last panel. Um, so the announcement is we have our fourth participant uh, from Trimble. Trimble. Um, Mr. Ed Jones is joining our panel. Uh, let me start with our first presenter, uh, Professor Nasser al Shami, a professor at University of Calgary. And also, he started a couple of years ago, Trusted Positioning, and uh, he holds CEO position in that company. Um, and without further ado, I'll actually turn the floor to him. Thank you very much, uh, Farshid, for the uh, short introduction. Can make it longer? Next <laughs> no, <time. laughs> no. This actually was my request. So I, uh, I saw that we were only three people, so I was targeting uh, 20 minutes, but uh, I have to speak fast. Uh, the good thing that when you speak uh, the last session, that you can definitely skip some of your slides because they either have been covered or uh, have been already, you know, covered in some of other presentations. So my presentation mainly focuses on sensors, and more specifically. MEM sensors and uh, what are the promise of these sensors for uh, location, uh, navigation applications and location-based services. So one of these uh, slides, uh, the first two slides, I'm gonna just going to go through them very quickly. Uh, there is no question that uh, RF technology have been witnessing a revolution over the last decade. We have been seeing uh, new signals, uh, for, for example, for civil signals in GPS. We have seen new satellites such as Galileo. We have seen also new uh, alternative GNSS such as the ISM that has been presented today. So uh, the net effect for the user that with new satellites will have more signals, will have, of course, better geometry and better availability and accuracy. But of course, the physics is physics. There is so many limitations that uh, has not been even uh, looked at you know, in more details. And also there's some problems that we still cannot overcome. For example, in GNSS, uh, availability is a big issue, specifically in urban centers. And of course, uh, inaccuracy due to multipass. In uh, wireless signals such as Wi-Fi and cell lock, we still have the infrastructure, as, in, as many of you mentioned today, is expensive and always, not always present. And also there is sparse network, which is uh, either uh, or poorly surveyed networks that, that definitely affect the accuracy for indoor navigation applications. The, on the other hand, we have what we call self-contained sensors. Uh, self-contained sensors are sensors that does not require any external signal. And uh, the most commonly, uh, you know, uh, sensors in, in this category are inertial sensors, which typically include accelerometers and gyros, which also have been witnessing a revolution over the last, uh, I would say, uh, 30 years. Uh, starting, let's say, in 1980, with uh, bulky systems that uh, are based on what we call ring laser gyros, that at that time, I think in 1980, I still remember the first system I worked with at the University of Calgary. This was actually late 1980s. Uh, late, uh, late 80s. It was costing about $300,000. It was from Honeywell. Then we started in 1990 seeing what we call fiber optics, uh, gyroscopes and fiber optic systems. That costing around 60000 at that time. However, the price are coming down to 20 k Of course, these uh, systems are uh, still expensive for many consumer applications. Uh, however, I must say that still fiber optic gyros are potential for indoor mapping that can lead to maps that can be used for, on, for uh, uh, indoor uh, navigation applications. It took, it, took the, it took us about, I would say, 40 years to come down to what we call micro-machine sensors, sensors that are costing a dollar and, uh, and less and isn't even having complete system in a ship that can be integrated in a smartphones. No wonder we start seeing many of these sensors in many of our day-to-day -day life, uh, uh, what you call uh, devices such as smartphones, BDAs, and cars. Of course, uh, MEM sensor has been used in cars a long time ago for, for non-navigation applications such as uh, airbag deployment, uh, stability of cars, and so on. However, in smartphones, the, uh, the, the, the sensor has been integrated also in the, in, the, in the portable devices also for other reasons, such as, for example, power control, uh, uh, con uh, switching on the, uh, the, the screen, and so on. Uh, 
uh, but I must say that uh, there is definitely uh, a promise of this sensor that they can also be used for navigation. If you look, for example, in some of the smartphones that has been released in the markets uh, in the last few months, for example, the, the Samsung Galaxy Note, the Samsung Galaxy Note contains already three gyroscopes from ST Micro, three accelerometer from Kionix, uh, one Bosch uh, parameter, one uh, GPS from Broadcom, plus, of course, high resolution cameras. With all the sensors, we have what we call over eight degrees of freedom that can also be used with GPS in order to bridge the GPS in areas uh, that, such as urban center, but also can be used in, in uh, uh, what you call it, in uh, 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 indoor navigation. So the real question is, since sensors already exist in these phones, why we have not seen so far uh, uh, a navigation application that can really take these phones into indoors uh, up to now? I think the, 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 the answer to this question has many faults, and uh, I will try just to give you some of the challenges from my perspective and from my trusted positioning perspective that has not, that, uh, that has been affecting the use of these sensors in uh, 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 indoor navigation. The first one is have to do with what we call usability. Typically, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure why it's uh, jumping, probably I'm, I'm pressing on something here. The, uh, the first one is, uh, is have to do with the usability of, uh, of uh, portable devices. You cannot really control the user uh, or the consumers. Consumers typically want to use the phone in any direction. I think uh, Frank, and unfortunately maybe he left, he showed the video in the morning that the, uh, the, uh, I think the smartphone was used for car navigation as well as an indoor navigation. But what uh, Frank did not mention is that the, the phone was actually restricted uh, to one direction, which is mainly the front direction of the uh, looking uh, uh, the front direction of the user, and also it was fixed in the dash of the of the vehicle. When we start using smartphones in, 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 in our day-to-day -day navigation, we cannot ask the user to do that for many reasons. Of course, there is many, 50 percent of the smartphone users are uh, young kids. They will never listen. They, there is no manual actually they can read for the smartphones, and therefore, you know, the the end requirement is mainly for the orientation and the and the position of the vehicle or the person, not the phone itself. And therefore, the software that has had to, you know, operate and, 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 and manage the sensors have to be smart enough to detect the orientation of the user and the orientation of the vehicle, not the orientation of the phone itself. So this is one of the constraints or one of the challenges. The second challenge is, again, smartphones will be used by people. These people will be walking, they will be driving, they will be riding a bus, they will be riding their car, and so on. Uh, it actually went to the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. It might be the papers. Yeah, it's okay. So, unfortunately, most, if not all, the navigation algorithms being used to date are, are platform specific. If you look again at the video that have been shown by Frank in the morning, the phone was fixed in the dash, and by doing so, you know, you are fixing the orientation between the user of the, and the vehicle. Right, and, th and the reason for that is that this triggers a specific algorithm to be used in vehicle only. When you use it, for example, when you use the phone for uh, BDR or what we call dead reckoning, pedestrian dead reckoning, typically most of the software require the phone to be fixed on the, on the belt of the user or to be handheld in front of the user. And therefore, again, these are uh, restricting, restri uh, in, uh, what you call a trigger a certain algorithm that use a, a specific accelerometer to detect the steps of the user. However, again, in, in, in consumer application, we cannot restrict the user you know, to, to mount the sensor in a certain direction. At the same time, we cannot restrict, we, can, we need to detect exactly which mode of, of, of conveyance the, the user is going through. And therefore, optimal algorithms are needed to detect whether the phone is being used in walking or being used in a car or being used in a train. So this is another, another challenge. The third challenge has to do with the sensors themselves. The sensor typically contains, any sensor contains errors, right? And the, the second uh, uh, issue with the sensors themselves is the physical loads that we use for the, uh, estimating the navigation of the sensors. Most, if not all, uh, 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 inertial navigation systems are based on integration. Integrating acceleration gives us velocity. Integration velocity gives us distances. And integrating gyro measurement gives us angles. Integration, by definition, means summation. So if you start with an error, you are actually summing these errors. And therefore, these errors will be accumulated, and this will end up with what we call drifted uh, position. And therefore, 
And even this is this uh, uh, accumulation of errors is even worse in the case of uh, MEMS sensor when compared to fiber optics and uh, ring laser gyros. And therefore, uh, uh, advanced sensor modeling are, is needed in order to deal with the high drift of this sensor. Just to show you an example, this is, for example, this is, for example, the uh, uh, vertical accelerometers in a static mode that cost about two to three dollars, typically used in some of the smartphones. Uh, in, in, if you put an accelerometer in vertical mode and static, the only force acting in that is gravity. And this, therefore, you expect that the accelerometer measure 9.8 meter per second square. If you look at this, you find that you have a bias. First of all, you have a constant error, which is about 50 milliG. This is very, very large error. If you integrate that, it will give you hundreds of meters in maybe a few seconds. The second thing, you also noted that you have some sort of correlated noise. Right? And therefore, you need to model that inside the uh, uh, fusion algorithm. The correlated noise of the, of the MEM sensors are much more severe than the uh, fiber optics and uh, uh, mechanical system or mechanical accelerometers. And therefore, again, we require uh, smart techniques in order to be able to uh, ac uh, account for this type of uh, correlated noise as well as constant bias. The other issue also has to do with the sensors that the manufacturing of these sensors, if you ask a manufacturer to give you a specification for a specific accelerometers, and you test hundreds of them, you'll find very large variability, which means that you have to calibrate each sensor before you actually use it for navigation. Calibrating a sensor that costs $2 might cost you actually 5 or $10, which will not worth it, will not be actually, will not be applicable, will not be used by many of the smartphone companies. And therefore, fusion algorithms must be smart enough to calibrate the sensor on the fly to detect both the constant error as well as the random error properly. Otherwise, this will accumulate into large position error. So these are some of the challenges that actually limit the uh, use of some of these sensors in navigation today. Solving this error, solving these challenges, I think will enable some of these sensors to be used in navigation application very soon. We at Trusted Positioning Navigation, Trusted Positioning uh, have really solved, the, solved many of these issues. And I would like to share with you some of the performance of some of the sensors that currently use in some of the smartphones. I will start, before I do, also there is some other uh, uh, constraint or some other ways to improve the accuracy of the systems, some of which we call velocity in the body frame. This velocity can be either coming from a vehicle, right, speed sensors, or it can be coming from an external signal such as a GPS, some of which have to do with the motion itself. For example, non horomic constraint is a typical constraint we can use in a vehicle. In a vehicle, in a vehicle you're not expecting the vehicle to jump up or skid left or right, and you can use this as zero velocity constraint along the lateral velocity and the vertical velocity. Odometer can also provide us, for example, from vehicle, provide us with longitudinal velocity. All this type of, velo of constraint can be used in uh, limiting the errors of the velocity uh, uh, of the accelerometers. And by limiting the velocity errors, you can also limit the position error. Uh, again, because of the sensor errors that are typically uh, uh, highly nonlinear, you require that the algorithm that's being used are advanced algorithm and most, mostly nonlinear techniques such as unsended camel filter or particle filter. Uh, because again of the sensor being very low cost, I'm expecting actually that in the next few years that you're gonna see multi-sensor along the same axis. And instead of using only single accelerometer along the X direction, why not use two or three sensors? The cost is not actually uh, a big issue for many consumer applications. Uh, I mentioned that many of the, the phones that I show as an example contains parameters and contains mags, and this gives you an extra degree of freedom for the vertical direction, and this will give you an extra degree of freedom for the azimuth, which is the major issue in many of the gyroscopes being used nowadays. Some other technique that can also use for improving the accuracy, backward smoothing. A backward smoothing is typically a post mission technique. It's not a real time. However, there is many ways that you can actually implement backward smoothing over, over very short time interval, let's say 10 seconds or 20 seconds. And by doing so, you can actually improve the accuracy of the sensor or recalibrate the sensor on the fly. So this is some of the challenges and some of the solutions that can help in improving the accuracy of micro-machine sensors. Having solving that, MEM sensor will open actually many, many new applications beyond just navigation. Examples, mobile advertising, mobile device and user orientation, which is very important when we talk about location-based services and tracking application. I hope Jalal was here to show him some of the uh, 
potential for them for, for MIM sensor for tracking applications. So I will try to show you a few examples. The first example was using the Samsung, uh, Samsung Galaxy Note, and this was actually for sport application. The, sh the, tra the following trajectory shows two trajectories, one red and G uh, which is GPS trajectory, the second one uh, the pure inertia navigation based on actually in GPS update every one minute every one minute, not every one second. You can see that actually the Samsung Note performance is very close to the GPS performance. Uh, and during this test, actually the, the phone was actually left to, to move freely with the, uh, with the user, so it was dangling, right? And in some scenarios that they actually, they're looking at the phone while they are actually running. So sports application are actually uh, some of the uh, apps that will be enabled by the smartphones. Uh, having, of, uh, of course, sensor in the smartphone will allow us to not only have position, but also velocity, orientation, counting how many steps, knowing the dynamics of the user, and thus allowing, improving the performance of athletes. <coughs> Going to the uh, major challenge with indoor, or indoor and outdoor, this is uh, 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 another example, which is for the Galaxy Nexus, which have an Invensense, an Invensense uh, uh, gyroscopes, I have a Bosch uh, three-axis accelerometer, a uh, 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 Bosch parameter, and a self-star for GPS receiver. This test was done actually in, in Madrid, and uh, I, the reason I want to show it is that you can clearly see in an urban environment, GPS multibus is very severe to the limit that actually at some, some points, although there is an open sky, that but because of severe multibus, the signal is totally, the phone totally lost track to the limit that actually the GPS is here while I, actually, I, I, was, I was actually doing this test, I was walking the left-hand side of, the, of this building. And then going inside uh, a mall, going out without GPS at all, and then if you look at the end, actually in this test we did not use the GPS till here. Uh, the, the, the position, the final position was actually on the other side of the road. It's about, about 15 meter error after about three, four meters of, uh, three, four minutes without GPS. The, Next test was actually totally without any GPS or Wi-Fi for almost nine minutes inside the building of our company. It included multi-floors, stairs, going through an elevator up and down for a total distance of about 450 meter, totally indoor, and the maximum error in this case was about six meter, which is about 1.5% of the total traffic distance. So there is definitely very high potential for, again, for MEM sensors to achieve uh, many of these uh, uh, approaches, the level that has been mentioned early in the morning. And again, this is totally without any uh, wireless technology inside the building. Also, there was a question by, I think, some of you and Jalal about the vertical. Uh, the nice thing about definitely uh, uh, MEM sensors and self-contained sensors that can, they can provide 3D, not only 2D. And this just showed the same test here that I showed a few seconds ago. In this test, we took actually the elevator to the second floor and we stopped at the first floor. And you can see actually, as soon as you go inside the building, the, the, of course there is noise, which is about 50 centimeter plus, plus or minus. But as soon as you go to the elevator, we stop at the second floor, exact height, almost 3.9 meter, going into the second floor, taking the average about 3.9 meter. So we can definitely use this sensor in estimating which floor and the elevation uh, uh, using uh, MEM sensors. Uh, I must say also in this test, we're not only relying on the accelerometers only on gyroscope, but also we have a barometer from the, from the phone. And I, I forgot to mention that in this test, the phone was actually again left uh, freely in the, in the user hand, so it was dangling. Right? And in many cases, it was actually the user was looking at it, uh, look at, looking at the phone, emulating that he or she was talking. So it was mainly you know, the typical scenario that the typical user uh, do when using smartphones. Moving to the potential of the sensor for uh, car navigation, and I only have, I, I know that I have car navigation. Uh, I believe that this sensor will, will uh, MEM sensor will definitely enable uh, many new applications such as assisted driving techniques and enhanced safety which is demanded by many car manufacturers. I will, I will show you two examples. One, uh, the first one is what we call um, uh, um, vehicle level uh, uh, MEM sensor, which cost about, in total, about uh, $80. So in this test, we are comparing a system that contains a GPS receiver from Novatel, 
uh, a vertical axis, one single axis gyro from silicon sensing, three axis accelerometer from um, SC micro, and we are collecting the OBD2 speed sensor wirelessly from the vehicle. And this was done in Detroit and was compared again as a 40K dollar system from uh, Novatel, which is, contains a, a Honeywell HG 1700 IMU with uh, a, a receiver. And the results from this system in post mission, which means that the data has been collected and then processed in post mission using DGPS was about one to two meter, 95% in the test. You can look, of course, in, in the test itself, there is many areas that we don't have GPS at all. In some cases, actually GPS was almost 100 meter away from the trajectory. And underneath that, you find the, te the trajectory from the $100 unit that almost have about 5.9 meter, 95% of the time. I'll show you that through a quick video, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll cut the video in the middle just for the sake of time. On the left-hand side, you have the, uh, the vehicle. I'm sorry, it seems like I lost the link for the video when I moved the uh, presentation here. But anyway, in this test, I just was showing the, the same test in 2D and also showing how the, again, $100 unit compared to the $40,000 unit. And again, most of the cases were almost exactly the same. At the end of the test, again, there was about 5.9 meter as an overall uh, accuracy. So. The other question is that in consumer application, you know, many of us take our car and bark in certain place. And when we bark, of course, in, let's say, indoor, we lose GPS. So the question is, can we start from this, you know, scenario going without GPS as, 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 uh, as, uh, as initial point? The question, the answer is yes. And I'm showing that through a test that we did actually in our building. Uh, and this test was done totally without GPS using the Galaxy Nexus phone. And this is, was about seven minutes without GPS. We started in, indoor, we went outside, we took it in the car, and then we started driving. Of course, in this case, the phone was actually left freely on the seat of the, of the, the uh, you know, the, uh, beside, the, beside the driver, and therefore the unit can be actually moving freely in any direction. Uh, of course, you expect that you will have an error, and you can see the error actually mainly in Osmos. We should actually be following this road, right, this small road here. And at the end, we should be actually this point, should be this point, which is about 55 meter after seven minutes. And the trajectory is about 2.2 kilometers. And in this case, about 2.5% of the travel distance. I must say that there is no speed sensor whatsoever has been used in this test. So the question is, how come in, in, in the phone performing in a vehicle at 2.5% while actually the phone was performing indoor at 1.5%, which is much better? I think the reason is that it depends on the, on the future algorithm that you are using. We are using actually a, a, a number of techniques parallel to each other, not only BDR. We don't rely on BDR. We rely on BDR, but also rely on the, in the physics of the sensor itself in order to improve the accuracy. We can do that in pedestrian, but we cannot do that in the vehicle itself. So I hope with that I have you know, shared with you some of the potential of these inertial sensors and uh, the promising performance of them. And I'm expecting that actually, you know, this performance will improve as the sensor performance improve as well. I must say that, you know, I start working with MEM sensors almost uh, eight years ago with the first, first sensors was coming from ADI. Nowadays, you can have the same performance for almost, you know, 100% of the cost of these sensors. Uh, also, the, the, uh, the, the noise level of the sensor is being improved over the last two years, and I'm expecting that oxygen performance in terms of uh, random walk and, uh, uh, you know, uh, noise level will be also improving, and this will also lead to improvement in the navigation performance of these sensors. Thank you very much. So